Hey, welcome back to Magic Ball Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Free Mars. Uh, this is the fifth data pack in the Red Sand Cycle. It just came out last Thursday, so it's been around for four days, and like we normally do, let's take some time to talk about it. Uh, we got, so we're gonna start with the runner side. We have, I think, nine cards or so. Um, if you're new to this, there are timestamps in the description below, so if there's a specific card that you're looking for, you can jump to that. That's what they're there for. Otherwise, we will start at the top. Or actually, no, we're not starting at the top. We're starting at the bottom. Um, this is the one I want to start with. So this is a runner, uh, it's a runner resource, a neutral resource. It's cost four to install. It's unique. It's called blue moose. So there's only one blue moose. It's a location. It's also the CD subtype, which is something we don't see that often. Um, and it says when your turn begins, you may remove one card in the heap from the game. If you do gain two credits and it's no influence, it's a pure neutral card. Wow, uh, the reason why I want to start with this card is it is a nuts card. This card's a really, really big deal. So, as long as you have a card in the heap that you can remove from the game, two credits. Beginning of your turn, two credits. That's a lot of money, because uh, this can fire almost all the time. And let's compare that to something that's been very standard in Netrunner ever since uh, creation and control the first deluxe set. This is a card called Daily Cast that you might be very familiar with. Uh, this is a very neutral card. You put this down, it costs three, which is one cheaper than your Blue Moose, but you get eight credits to a turn. Um, Blue Moose for the low, low price of one extra credit. This is a daily cast that never ends. As long as you have cards in your heap, which I promise you is actually not that difficult to do. Um, you are removing the, these cards from the game, but if you never plan to recur those cards, which a lot of decks have no interest in recurring themselves, or at least a bunch of their cards, this is a daily cast that doesn't stop. The train just doesn't stop, and that's kind of crazy. Um, now, to get this thing to fire, you got to put cards in your heap. How do you do that? There's a lot of good ways to do that. Um, if you want to talk about like proactive ways that you can build a card engine around, uh, you can do something like Aesop's Pawn Shop, and at the beginning of your turn, you can trash a card, gain three from Aesop's Pawn Shop, and then fire at the beginning of a turn on Blue Moose, and you basically trash a card straight out of the game, gain five credits at the beginning of your turn. That's pretty cool. Um, you see these sort of engines and noise decks that play a lot of viruses. It does get a bit dicey, because sometimes noise does want to recur certain viruses, but not all of them sometimes, so this might actually be a thing. Interestingly enough, also, you can start using this with ChopBot if you want to just draw a card and gain two credits at the beginning of your noise turn, which is probably not that bad at all. And I could see other decks even capitalizing on that in Anarch. There's a lot of, like, weird trashable stuff. Other ways to get cards in your in your bin? Faust is a good card. Um, and the ability to throw a card away whenever you want, even if you don't... Like, even if you have five cards in your hand and your turn's about to begin, on the corpse turn, during a paid ability window, you can trash a card to give plus two strength. So you can just throw things out. Um... Which can be okay if you need the money. You also got Null, whose ability technically works really well with Blue Moose. It gives you kind of feed for the for the Blue Moose. And another good way is just to draw cards. I've seen Daredevil see play for one influence. It's actually really good in Null. I didn't I did not realize how good this card was in Null. But the idea is that sometimes just drawing on your turn, you have to discard cards at the end of your turn. Um, and that's a good way to get Blue Moose. But it's not just discarding cards or trashing cards. When you play a card, they obviously they go to your heap. Or, yeah, your heap. So the idea is that if you're playing a Sure Gamble, and this is a card that's a three of in almost every deck in the game, you play your Sure Gamble, you gain your four credits, it goes to your heap, you're not going to recur the Sure Gamble in about 90% of the decks, the runner decks, at least on the competitive level. Uh, so you can just remove it for two extra credits, which makes all your Sure Gambles six credits. You're not going to recur your Earthrise Hotels. It's two credits once it's done. It's... There's so much easy ways to get value off of this because there's a lot of decks that plan to recur nothing and there's a lot of cards that either trash themselves or just any event really trashes itself after it plays and you can remove it for the game for two credits. Daily casts doesn't end. Um, interestingly enough, this card does play weirdly with Levy. The idea is that you're going to be removing cards from the heap so if you have a deck that relies on Levy, they might not work entirely well together. There might be a bit of an anti-synergy but also you can kind of tailor your Levy to your Blue Moon. The idea is that when you're using your Blue Moose on your first run through your deck, you remove all your redundant hardware, you remove all your resources that you have extra copies of, and then when you do Levy, if you are playing Levy, you, your second deck is all just like run of op, run events and econ and all the good stuff you want, which is actually kind of exciting if you want to pair these together. This card's nuts. Uh, it's really cool. Um, I just want to talk a bit about the design. We've seen a lot of things to combat recursion. Recursion is a really, really powerful thing in about any card game, but it's proven to be incredibly powerful and actually kind of an issue in Netrunner. A lot of times, recursion is generally too strong. And we've seen on the corpse side cards getting plant printed like Arc Lockdown but somewhat recently, and we had Scorpio's Defense System relatively recently, which are cards that are just like very, very 
brute force blunt answers to the recursion problem. Um, I'm not a big fan of either of these cards, but I think it's quite interesting that FFG has, instead of deciding to like combat recursion, to actually encourage you not to recur. And printing a card like Blue Moose has you, it does provide a good reason not to recur your things or to build a deck that maybe doesn't want to recur endlessly. And that's kind of interesting. I think that's a much more positive way to, to design things where you encourage the way you want to play instead of punishing a different way. I don't know, maybe they're both as effective, but Blue Moose is really good. And just to talk a bit, just quickly about this, I pulled up two decks. These are two decks that were in the Atlanta Regional, which is a regional that just wrapped up, and this is just an Andromeda deck. And like, looking at the cards here, you, this deck doesn't run a Levy AR Lab Access, it's not playing to recur itself, but it does run daily casts. And the idea that you can swap in some Blue Moose instead of your daily casts, you can get this early, cheaply down by playing Career Fair, look at all the targets you have. You might want to recur your count sevens because you got two similar things, but you're not going to recur your career fair. That's two credits a pop. Exploit, two credits a pop. Information sifting, maybe you recur that. Rebirth, no, it's out of the game. You don't want to recur your special orders, your sure gambles, your second doppelganger is useless, your feedback filter is useless in so many matchups. Second Aaron, not always useful. Third Aeneas, don't always need it. Daily cast also works well with Blue Moose because you can just remove it from the game after to get two more credits. Earthrise, don't recur these. Same old things. Once they're out of the game, they're out of the game. Temujin, out of the game, out of the game. This card is money. It is nearly a permanent daily cast, and I think that's kind of exciting. We have another one here just to look through really quickly how easily you can slot this card in into almost any deck and see results. Uh, this is an Anarch deck. It also, um, I've been having a lot of fun playing this deck. This also was in the Atlanta Regionals. It uh, did pretty well. It came in fourth, in fact. Um, but all these cards, they don't recur. Like, you don't not going to recur your I've had worse, your Inject, your, maybe you do recur your stomach, your Gambles, your Second Maw, your Earth Rises, your Street Peddlers, your Liberty Counts, your Temujins. Like, these are cards you're not going to recur. In some matchups, you don't recur your Davids, and this is just money. And for a deck that runs two daily casts, I think it just deck just gets strictly better with Blue Moose. It might not be, like, functionally the most interesting card. It actually might produce some interesting circumstances in which there's a card in your heap, it's an account siphon, you think maybe in three turns I want to recur it with the same old thing, but I need the money now, so what do I do? And that's kind of cool. But this card is nuts. Uh, it's really good. I think this is a big boon to um, Noise. Noise virus builds might be coming back because of this. This really helps Noise. Um, and it's just good. It's a good card. You have thrown cards out at the end of your turn, remove them from the game. You ever overdrawing, remove things from the game. You can build an econ engine out of this, and it's easy to slot this into any deck, which is good, because not only does it make the competitive stuff slightly more reliable, because you have reliable econ, but it also lets you do wacky stuff, where you can play some weird decks and you have more neutral econ options, and that's something the game is always good to see. Just neutral econ economy options a lot of times is good, because it makes weird things more viable, because they have these like fun foundations to lie on, and I think that's really good. All right. We're going to the Anarch stuff, and this is Mars for Martians. It's actually a card we talked about before. Uh, it's come up a bunch of times. Um, they're preparing. Anyways, this card has come up a bunch of times. I've actually talked about it indirectly for the last, like, I think five months now. Because I think the existence of this card might actually be a really big deal. But before we get to that, let's just read it real quick. It's cost nothing. It's called Mars for Martians. It has uh, somebody yelling. Um, into the into the combat. It's a priority event, which is a certain type of event means you can only play it as your first click. So it's the first thing you have to do with your turn. That means you can't play it with the same old thing if you need to like recur it for some reason. You have to do it click one. And its ability is pretty simple. It says draw one card for each installed clan resource and then gain a credit for each tag you have. And it's also very important to understand this card not only is a free, it's only one influence. So you can easily put three of these in almost any deck you'd ever want. So let's look at this ability in two parts. Firstly, draw one card for each installed clan resource. How many clan resources are there? That's a new subtype that's only showed up in the red sand cycle, so we're not actually working with a lot here. We're working with three cards specifically. It might be more in the next data pack. Uh, but we got Clan Vengeance, which is a card that you could, in theory, play. Mm, but I don't think it works that well with the sort of archetype that you're going with, considering, mind you, that to play this card, you need a lot of tags. And if you have a lot of tags, maybe the runner, the corp will trash this. Maybe. Uh, you have Counter Surveillance, which I think is an amazing card with this card. Like, it's a good combination, but I don't think this card stays on the table because as soon as it's on the table, it's probably going to be trashed because it represents a win condition. And then you have Yorogni of Mercs, which I think you could play together. So I don't think the draw part of this card is going to be that good currently, but with more clan resources, uh, it'll get better. I think maybe you draw one card out of this. Maybe two. I don't know. But a lot of these cards are unique too, right? Oh, only Yorog Yorogni of Mercs is. That's okay. Because even if you're not drawing a lot with this card, gain one click for each tag you have is nuts. 
This is nuts. And I've talked about this for a while that I think this card is going to be really scary and it's going to really push forward uh, a bunch of play styles that I know a lot of people don't enjoy in the game uh, because it's a very negative play experience and that it's, it hinges on this card. Uh, Count Siphon, this is from the core set, and it's a brutal card. It's one of the strongest cards in the whole game. It's, it's like a meta-defining card. It's always been a meta-defining card. And the idea is that this card, you make a run on HQ, there's a 15 credit swing, which is nuts, and then you take two tags. Now the now the idea with this is is if you can continue spamming account siphons in any deck, you can play this in Anarch, you can play this in Criminal, you can even play this in Shaper, you have a way to back this up with even more money? Um, which is actually surprisingly useful considering this card also gives you money. So if you have a deck that plays a Count Siphon, you can recur this. You play one Count Siphon, now you can same old thing it. If you're playing Anarch, you can Deja Vu it. People are even playing Shadow Net to get a bunch of tags. And now you can easily have, like it's not out of the question to say by like turn 8. You could have if you're incredibly aggressive. Uh, maybe you have Ballpark, I don't know, maybe 10 tags? Maybe 10 tags? I don't know. Maybe you landed 5 Siphons. And if you land 5 Siphons, this card says click gain 10 credits. And that's nuts. That's kind of incredible. This is unbounded. It's like unlimited. This card can in theory give you 100 credits in the right circumstances. And I've played games before where people have stopped caring how many tags they have. Because it largely doesn't matter. They get to a point where they have like 8, 10 tags and they're like, oh, I'm not going to count. Just say I'm tagged, right? That happens. Uh, in specific matchups, that's acceptable practice. Uh... And this card rewards you for doing that. So this card is a really good econ option if all you want to do is place account siphon over and over again. And there's other ways to do this if you want to get tags. Uh, in Shaper you have Maya, which is a really cool console that doesn't see enough play, that lets you get a tag to do some ridiculous R&D multi-axis, and, and R&D like reshuffling, or not even shuffling, but like rearranging, and that's really cool. Um, in Anarch you have a lot of ways to do this. You can play Joshua B down as a tempo play. You pay this for one credit, you get five clicks, you take a tag, now the Corp has to trash this, and if they don't trash it, you're gonna have five more clicks five clicks next turn and then you get more money from this thing you can just pile on the tags and this is the kind of card that you see in a data leak reversal deck and this is a deck that won worlds two years ago a deck archetype that won worlds two years ago almost won worlds last year and it's a very negative play experience deck i play data leak reversal decks at a competitive level i think they're kind of fun they're not really fun to play against but the idea is it's not hard to get a lot of tags put the runner in a really bad spot and then you have this like in your back pocket this card also pairs really well with a card that I don't like, and that's Vamp. And it pairs so well with Vamp. Uh, the idea is if you're playing a heavy account siphon deck, you probably have a lot of money, and your deck probably cares that the corp doesn't have money, because you're playing Data League Reversal, and they need credits to trash this thing. So you can Vamp the corp down, and which you have a lot of money, because you're account siphoning and doing all that stuff. And you can Vamp the corp down for all your money. You can go down to zero credits. Now the corp has zero credits, you have zero credits, and the next turn you just click for 12. And you're back in the races. Like, this makes Vamp easier to hit and also makes Vamp recovery so easy. And admittedly, like, Data League Reversal and Vamp are only going to be around for another two months before rotation hits. Uh, bless its heart. But this is a really scary package we're talking about. This Count Siphon, Vamp, just go nuts. Uh, you also have other things like John Masanori. I guess you could play this and float the tags and take a tag and be like, oh, you're making me stronger. Joke's on you. And that's true, but it is a resource. Maybe they trash it. This card's also a really big deal because now you can look at different matchups as good for you. This is an ice that does very little besides give you tags, and if your deck relies on things like Mars for Martians, or if the Corp gives you a tag, you're actually excited because they gave you one to three credits based on how many of these you fire in a game. That's insane. Uh, and the Corp might realize they don't have a lot of ice, and yeah, there is ice that becomes relevant when you're tagged, but like controlling the message in theory, if you're playing an account siphon wizard, becomes uh, trash and acid, gain a tag, gain a credit, somewhat, in some sort of argument. There's a couple punishments to being tagged. Uh, there's a couple of them. One of them is dying, which is something you might have to prepare for. Like if the if you are heavily tagged, you know, uh, the rockets can come. So you got to prepare for that. Uh, so besides that, there's a couple other ways. I think closed accounts is a pretty good thing to do to someone if they're tagged. If they have no money, it's very hard for them to interact with you. And I think that makes this card very, very potent. The idea is that if I'm playing Tag Me and as a tech, uh, the corporation plays closed accounts and they think, oh, ha, I got you. Now, first click, you can recover. And even if you're playing Mars from Martians for gaining four credits because you landed two siphons, that's a sure gamble you play from zero. And that's still really good. Like, you don't need ten tags for this to be good. Even if you play this with four tags, it's fine. 
It's really good. And I think it's interesting that I think a lot of times when you're playing Tag Me, you might want to keep a Mars for Martians in hand until the Corp does close your accounts or something terrible happens so that you have a way of recovering. I don't think you might want to play this proactively if you expect to close accounts because this is the best recovery tool in the game from Tag Me closed accounts. The other way that you have to go to watch out, you do have psychographics and you do have to watch out for this one. Um, it's kind of hard to watch out for this one, but uh, just be careful. And this card came up before, and this is the biggest reason, 100% the biggest reason why I'm uh, really kind of worried about this. And this is a card that came out in the first data pack of the cycle, and I, when we talked about it in the unboxing, I said this was an absurdly powerful card. And to date, in the competitive like season that I've seen decks and results for, it hasn't proven me to be correct about this. And I think that this is the card that it needed, because these two cards pair together absolutely beautifully. If you manage to give yourself 12, 14 tags, shit, even if you give yourself 4 tags, it's not bad, but if you give yourself 12, 14 tags by just playing a Count Siphon every turn, twice a turn for a bit, you now have a combo that's absolutely nuts. You play Mars for Martians, you have as many credits as you have tags, you run R&D, first you install Counter Surveillance, run R&D, pay that 14 credits you got from your Mars for Martians and see 14 cards off of R&D, which is a win condition. Mars for Martians makes counter surveillance as long as you have the tags, which, mind you, isn't that difficult if you do all the things that we talked about to this point. Such an easy win condition. As long as you have enough credits or cards if you're playing Faust to get into the R&D ice. And that's crazy. I'm really worried about this. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of decks showing up that are just like, I don't know, Steve Cambridge, Account Siphon. Maybe Anarch is just better because you have access to Deja Vu, which is another way to recur your Account Siphon. Uh, this is a bit too much influence for criminals to spend a lot of time. And you just play Account Siphon over and over again. It's like you got a lot of tags, and then you play this one influence card, and then whether or not you want to put counter surveillance in there, that's up to you. But Account Siphon is better than it's ever been to date as of now because this card is an insane backup plan it is an aggressive card it is a defensive recovery card it does everything you want it's one influence it costs nothing to play and sometimes it draws you a card this is crazy and we're not done here this is god of war um uh it's a it's a anarch uh, it's an icebreaker it's a program it's an icebreaker it's also an ai and a virus we haven't seen that for a while right Crypsis. also oh yeah the fish darwin it's four to install, it's one MU, and it says when your turn begins, you may take one tag to place two virus counters on God of War. What are the virus counters for? You can use a host of virus counter at any paid ability window to break an ice subroutine, so generally when you're dealing with an ice. It comes in at zero strength, which is abysmal, but it says two credits for plus one strength. Subtle, you really don't understand the point of all this, do you? Alice Merchant. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, just in terms of the flavor... This is the God of War, which is Mars. Mars is the God of War, the Roman God of War. And we are on, are on Mars, so it makes sense that we have Mars here. Uh, in ancient Roman religion and myth, Mars was the God of War and also an agricultural guardian. And a lot of what we've seen so far on Mars has been combat and growing plants. So that's really cool. Oh, also, we've seen space travel and stuff like that. But that makes sense. Um, so that's cool. This is the God of War. Again, it's a card that's broken into two parts, just like our previous Anarch card. Part number one, how is it as a breaker? It's not good. Um, so when your turn starts, you got two virus counters on there if you want to take a tag. Uh, and the thing is, if you want to do this every turn to get a bunch of virus counters on here, at any point in time, the corp can purge viruses, and this gets wiped. It's actually very similar to Darwin, a card that's another ice Icebreaker AI virus that slowly gets more powerful the more turns it's on the table before the corp purges, putting it back to square one. And square one for God of War is being able to break two separate teams. Square one for Darwin is one strength. It's These work differently, interestingly differently. It's just swapped. Like, Darwin gets to deal with bigger ice, but... Uh, God of War gets to deal with more subroutines. If you ask me, technically I think subroutines is easier to deal with just because you have things to deal with this. Like you have E3 feedback implants if you really want to use your God of War as your icebreaker because you can always use one virus counter and then click with E3 or sorry, spend credits with E3 feedback implants. So that's a bit flexible. You do have to watch out though. Uh, Cyberdex virus suite at any point in time you encounter a piece of ice that's really deadly and you think, oh, I'm gonna break this with my God of War and then the Cyberdex virus suite gets used. That can be bad. Also for what it's worth, if you need to boost the strength, because this icebreaker, mind you, is absolutely incredibly expensive. Uh, the install cost is not terrible. 
the not spending anything to break subroutines is really good but the fact that it comes at zero and it's two credits for one strength is miserable if you want to break like an architect like your standard run-of-the-mill three strength sentry it's going to cost you six credits which is too much um that's a lot and for that say i wouldn't say that god of war can be your like main breaker your your normal I'm going to break this for everything, but it's actually useful as a backup breaker for certain instances, and it's also very useful for the second part of the text we're talking about. For what it's worth, you can mitigate a lot of these problems if you play Dean Lister, because Dean Lister says this will probably be about 5 strength for the rest of the run, and that's really good if this is your only icebreaker. Uh, for what it's worth, i got too many tabs open here. Um, for Oh, shit. Uh, okay, that's how that works. For what it's worth, you cannot... Like if you avoid the tag with something like a New Angel City Hall, it's not considered you paying the cost, so you don't actually get the virus counters. So if you want to play this as a card where you take the tag and then remove it just to have an icebreaker, it's going to be incredibly clumsy. Like that's really a bad idea. So I think if you're playing this, you're going to take the tags. You can't dodge them, and even if you could, it wouldn't be a good breaker. So this is the card that we just saw, Mars for Martians, and it might be obvious that these two work really well together. If your plan was from turn 1 to go tag me, it's not bad to have God of War on the table and almost never use it as a breaker, but every turn take a tag. Because what is that doing? It is giving you at some point, it's like kind of getting a credit every turn, at some point you'll draw your Mars from Martians and be able to cash out on it, but also you're making that counter surveillance that is your win condition, you're making that possible. You're getting to that point where your counter surveillance is going to be really, really, really big and maybe game winning. So maybe if you do get this down turn one, it's kind of difficult. It is expensive. By turn 10, you can see 10 cards or by turn 11, technically, because you need another turn for this to charge. But by turn 11, maybe that's all you need. That's kind of crazy. Um, and I think this card is really good with this counter surveillance strategy. It's also probably pretty great with Mars for Martians. But I think it's actually going to see the most play with something that's not very interactive and a lot of people might not think is fun. This is Citadel Sanctuary. It says if you are tagged when your turn ends, you can force the corp to trace. And if unsuccessful, if you win the trace, so the corp has to boost and then you can always like boost after that, you remove the tag. Which means at the beginning of your turn, you have a card that clicklessly gives you a tag, and at the end of your turn, as long as you have more money than the corp, you can clicklessly remove the tag, which gives you four turns while you have a tag. And that's a really big deal, because again, we have a card, I think we have it here, uh, we'll just open it again, called Data Leak Reversal. So you can, beginning your turn, take a tag with God of War, click four times to trash the top four cards off the runner's R&D, and then remove the tag with Citadel Sanctuary, as long as you have the finances to do that. And that's brutal. We've actually seen this sort of deck be uh, very, very, very powerful. Uh, this is Dean. Uh, Dean Tran from Toronto. He won a thing here with this, the EOI and Tier deck. And they play this sort of idea in Andromeda. That they would uh, basically give themselves a tag, just hit a couple times a deck league reversal, and then remove the tag. And they were actually doing this deck before. Alex Bradley from uh, Ottawa was doing this too. He's the Canadian National Champion of last year. They were doing this with Security Nexus, a card that would let you get a tag on your own accord. And that's what this deck did. It kind of just sat back, got a tag at the beginning of the turn, milled the corp four times, removed the tag, and there's very little interaction. And it's very hard to deal with. And this is actually a really easy way to do it. You could do it in Anarch. You could also do it in Criminal. Both of these cost cards cost three credits. Security Nexus is a good card on its own, so I don't know if this is better than it, but you can do this now in Anarch, and it's probably okay. That scares me. This deck's really hard to deal with, and it's not a lot of fun to play against. Um... Another weird thing about this card that makes it interesting, if your pl game plan is on data leak reversal or maybe account siphon, and a lot of people would rely on Eater as their main breaker, and the thing with Eater, it does let you land your account siphons, but it does not let you run archives to get through ice to access the agendas that you maybe have milled with data leak reversal, or perhaps even if you're going aggressive for a different reason, Keyhole. And while I think, that's Keyhole, while I think that God of War is obviously not the best breaker, even its existence on the table as a constant threat of like, okay, at any point in time, I can run archives and I can access as long as I have enough money, is pretty potent. That you don't need to trash the ice on archives to be able to get the cards that you've milled with your data lake reversal. And for that reason, it's pretty good. I also think on the basis that if you're putting that much pressure on the corp every turn where you're milling four cards and the corp understands they have to go fast, uh, they won't be able to purge your God of War. So it's not unreasonable that your God of War actually has like six to eight virus counters on it and you can make like a really impactful run on HQ. Maybe to get the more account siphons down, maybe just to do whatever annoying nonsense you're doing. 
I'm scared. I'm kind of worried about this. We have two more months where Data League Reversal is still in the Netrunner card pool. And I think now with everything with Data League Reversal, your Yor of Mercs also works really well with these cards that print tags. Um, this is going to be scary. Because right now, better than ever, I'm pretty sure Data League Reversal with Mars for Martians, Counter Surveillance, and all this stuff is super good. And it's generally brutal. I know a lot of new players don't like playing against it. So, like, you don't have to. It's a very competitive deck. There's no reason you have to play that for fun, but... Just watch it out, because that looks really good. That looks really good. These are your Shaper cards. Excuse me. It's called Lean and Mean. It's a run event. It costs two credits, and it says make a run. If you have three or fewer programs installed, all Icebreakers have plus two strength during this run. And as a quote from Cabanessa Wu, I would expect that's Cabanessa Wu on the art itself. Uh, here's to hoping she comes out in this cycle. I don't think she is for what that's worth. And it's only one influence too, which is uh, pretty splashable. So what does this card do? This card does two things. Well, it does one thing really. It gives you strength on your breakers. And you can see that in one of two camps, uh, just like how we always dissect things here. It's either you can see it as an economy card, as something that saves you money, because normally you're spending credits to boost, so this will save you some money. Or in the circumstance in which your breakers are unable to boost strength, uh, and that gives you the ability to boost strength, which is much more valuable. Uh, yeah, I'd argue that's more valuable than an economy option. Looking at the economy option, it's actually pretty bad, I think. The way I see it, this card is not... Like, if you just put a card in your deck instead of this one that just gives you credits, just like some way to generate credits, like a Blue Moose, a Daily Cast, a Sure Gamble, you'll probably get more value than this card. Because let's just talk about like what it takes to get value out of this card. So you need to be running. Sure, okay, you have to have three or fewer programs installed. That might not be that difficult if you're running a lean rig. That's easy. It's lean and mean, right? But all your icebreakers have plus two strength during this run. And let's just go off some standards. And actually, when I was preparing this, I wanted to go off the standard of Gordian Blade. But Gordian Blade actually makes this card a bit worse because Gordian Blade retains strength. So the value with Gordian Blade with lean and mean is not so good. So let's just do Snowball. So plus two strength on a lot of breakers means plus two credits on most of the conventional boost strength breakers. So if you're using one program, say you're running through one piece of ice, this card's not great, obviously, because you're spending two credits to get plus two strength, which is generally worth two credits. So you break even, except this is a card that you had to put in your deck. So that's not great. Now, if you have two pieces of ice, and mind you, both of these pieces of ice require your breakers to boost by two, now you're playing this card for two, and you're saving four. So you're only saving two credits, which makes this card not fantastic, because it says gain two credits, basically, which isn't great. Uh, it's actually worse than that, because it requires a run, and it's not credits you can get soon to be able to build your board state. It's, you know, it's it's a bit clumsy. Um, go away, Razor Synapse. Uh... Excuse me. Um, now, if you have three breakers, again, you have to be able to have to go through three pieces of ice. All those pieces of ice have to be at least two strength higher than your breaker. And in that case, you're paying two to save six. So you're saving four, which puts it on par with a sure gamble. Um, and a sure gamble, you can play at almost any point in the game and it gives you money to set up. It's just a lot better than lean and mean. Lean and mean requires this ridiculous circumstance of you having the three breakers or three programs. Not that difficult. But having to go through three pieces of ice, all of them that need strength boosts, but plus two just to get some value out of it. And that seems kind of absurd, uh, considering card slots are very tight in Netrunner. And just as an economy option, this kind of seems underwhelming. We've seen cards like this before, and a lot of these don't see play. Like, this is an injection attack, which it costs one, and it just says choose an icebreaker, that icebreaker gets plus two. So, it's twice as, uh, it's half the cost, but it's only one breaker, and it doesn't have the condition. So, you decide what works better for your deck if you think you need one of these. We also saw pushing the envelope, oh, envelope earlier this this cycle and this one's terrible it's three credits but it gives all your icebreakers plus two but the condition attached to it is really hard to control and this is just as good basically but one influence i don't get it these cards are super similar but this one's really bad uh all in all i don't get it like just having it as an econ option is not fantastic because this the situation for everything to line up is pretty bad um the other situation that we talked about is having it to work with cards that have no ability to boost their own strength and that actually makes this card more interesting because it provides something that you couldn't do before so like if we look at something like yog which can only deal with code gates of three strength uh the deal idea they can play lean and mean and then yog through a five strength code gate is kind of cool i guess but 
The problem is ultimately there are better ways to do that. This is another option. This is Savant. And Savant, perhaps, you uh, you uh, need to make it higher strength than it is so you can lean and mean through. But this is Shaper we're talking about. And Shaper has so many better ways to deal with this. For two credits, you can attach this to any card. And generally, only like how many fixed strength breakers are you running in your deck? Maybe one or two. But for this, you can put this two credits for plus four strength for the rest of the game. You even have net ready eyes that says plus one strength for any program that your choice for each run, and it costs nothing. You take taking that meat damage, but it costs nothing. This is leaner and meaner, if you ask me. And even this is a personal touch from the core set, which gives you any plus one strength forever. Forever. So you save a credit maybe every turn. Maybe you save two credits a turn because you're running twice or two different servers, and this costs the same. And also hardware is much easier to play for shapers. Shapers are good at installing things. Shapers aren't good at playing events. I don't get it. Uh, this card is like, I would say the opposite of lean and mean. It's kind of, like, I understand what it means lean and mean with the rig, but it's kind of clunky and it doesn't actually do that much considering the other options. You have to draw at the right time. You draw this early when you don't need it. It's gonna be bad. Uh... Not sold on it. Kabanessa Wu, I'm excited to see. Her console is really cool if Daredevil is her console, but I am not too sold on One influence, you can put this anywhere. But again, I don't get it. If you also only, by the way, if you have one program and it's all you're using this for, you're going as lean as possible. Like we said earlier in this thing, you have Dean Lister, which is generally a better option because you can put this on the table. It'll stay there forever, so you don't have to use it right away. It doesn't clog your hand. And if you're doing like a very lean setup, Dean Lister is generally better than lean and mean. So I don't know. It's in a space that's generally held by other cards, and having it be an event with conditions attached to it that's kind of expensive, I don't see it entirely. Alright, this might make a bit more sense now with the, the Maven. Uh, that's some Professor Frank. Is it Fink? I think it's Fink. This is Maven. Maven's five credits to install. It's 2MU. It's a program. It's an icebreaker. It's another AI. This is the second AI in the set so far. And uh, it says very little on it. It has two credits to break an ice subroutine, and it comes in at zero strength. But it has the clause that Maven has plus one strength for each installed program. It's also three influence. It's very important to understand Maven is an installed program once it's installed, so for all intents, intents and purposes, uh, Maven is one strength, because you install it, it counts itself. So you have a one strength breaker that can't be pumped that uh, breaks subroutines for two at a time. Okay, uh, obviously that's not great. You're gonna want this to be a bigger strength. It is an icebreaker AI, and that's one of the value it has. Like this could, in theory, be your only program, your only breaker. Um, and I think that's probably how you want to do this. This card's actually kind of interesting. Firstly, I just want to say two credits for a subroutine has not proven in this game to be that good. And I say this so many times when new icebreakers come out with this printed on it. It's generally very clumsy. It's pretty expensive. Uh, a lot of ice have a lot of subroutines, so that's going to be a fair bit of money. You do have things like E3 feedback implants, like we say every time when attached to a subpar breaker, that makes it a lot cheaper. Uh, it actually yeah reduces prices significantly. So you might want to consider these together if this is your main breaker. So if Maven has one plus strength for each installed program, you gotta install a lot of programs. And how do you do that? Uh, well, you're playing Shaper, so you're generally good installing programs. In fact, they made a card to do that called Mass Install. You gotta draw all your cards at once. But you have a lot of ways to getting all those programs out. Um, Degdeer is a recent new card. You put this down, it's technically a program, you host a thing on it, it's technically a program too, it's also cheaper and they take up no MU, so now your Maven is suddenly a lot higher strength and you still have all this MU to work with. Uh, similarly, you have Leprechaun, which can host two programs. So you put your Leprechaun, put two more things on it, and eventually your Maven's like Strength 6, Strength 7, which might be all you actually need. And that's kind of cool. You also have Netchip, which is neat. Uh, I haven't seen this card see much play on the table, but it gives you like a lot of MU if you want it. Um, and that's kind of cool. Um, in terms of also boosting strength, just like we said before, if you want to deal with things like this, like if you need a way to boost the strength on your Maven, if you don't have enough programs down, you can always play your dedicated processor, and that's good. Ironically enough, like Maven works pretty poorly with lean and mean because it says if you have three or fewer programs installed, you can use lean or mean to boost strength. But for Maven, you want like nine programs installed. So it's kind of weird that these come together because they do not seem at all compatible. So, oops. So what are you doing? Why are you installing so many programs? I think it might be a bad idea to install other... Oh, this is 2MU, by the way. That's like a pretty big deal. So maybe you also want to put this on the deck, dear. Or a leprechaun. Um, 
So why are you installing all these programs? Like, I think it's super redundant if you install this and then install a bunch of other icebreakers, because I will promise you a lot of times like, your other icebreakers might actually be cheaper at breaking stuff, especially small stuff with a lot of subroutines. Maybe you want to do that, so you always have an option. But we're going to go the other way. Like, yeah, you could build a Maven and you could build all your programs. Maybe this is the last thing you installed and it'll break certain ice cheaper than anything else. I don't know at a five credit investment, but let's look at if we want to build a dedicated Maven deck. What can we do? And let's look at all the things that we can install considering that you play dig deers and everything and this is it's cool this is the kind of fun design where it encourages you to play all the cards that we haven't seen a lot before it's kind of like rosetta 2.0 that lets weird things become sort of viable so you can start playing utility cards and i'm gonna run through a bunch i pulled up a bunch real quick uh collective consciousness you can now play this in theory get some free card draw that's also really good to find your cards you have things like deep thought maybe you want to put your deep thought down maybe you want to put your chicana down and play some virus shaper that's fun i think an actually compelling thing might be to build a rig full of cloaks and multi-threaders and then maven and then you're breaking with your maven which is like strength six or whatever but you're paying very little to do it you have all this recurring credit money and i think that's pretty cool maybe you play that with mirror to get your recurring credits back you can also play parisha and it makes parisha a lot better because it's not only recurring credits to trash all those pesky assets but it makes your your friend here maven a lot stronger i like this art a lot you have also cards like Sahasra, maybe install all your programs for cheap. Data Sucker is so good with Maven because it gives it strength in so many different ways and you generally want that. You also have things like Magnum Opus, always good. Au Revoir, maybe this is the card you need in your Au Revoir snitch engine that already plays like five other programs and now you just put your Maven and it's the only icebreaker you need, maybe. Quivocation, it's good. Tech cards, Net Shield, it's good. Um, for a while, I was actually looking at these uh, cloud breakers. These are breakers that you can install, and, and as long as you have two link, they don't actually take up any MU, so it's easy to install a lot of them. But I'm pretty sure if you're playing like these breakers, as expensive as they are, a lot of times they actually might be cheaper to use than your Maven. So I don't know about that, but it actually makes me sort of interested in using like the break and enter suite with a Geist deck, perhaps, and have all these things installed and then just use Maven. But then you're not card drawing, so it's weird. But is deck technically possible? Um... It's wild. Uh, this is an interesting program. It, I don't know. It's going to take a, a lot of setup. Like it's, I think you need backup for this because turn one, you can be rushed out behind a single piece of ice. Like an Enigma, that's going to be an issue. Actually, maybe not. You just have to install two programs. Maybe. But it's definitely neat. And it can encourage a lot of weird things where you're playing all these other programs. And I'm excited to see cards that like open up the design space. So it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting card. Remember, it does come in at one strength. So it's, it, it's okay. It's all right. Um, talking about all right, this is a new uh, program. It's an icebreaker. It's a killer. It's a shaper killer. It deals with sentries. It costs four credits. It's one MU. It's called Nanotech. And it says, uh, let's talk about its numbers. It says it's one credit to break a sentry subroutine. Gold standard. Three credits for plus two strength. Not terrible. Uh, and it comes in at one strength. Not great, but it says during each run, Nanotech has plus one strength for each piece of ice protecting the attacked server. And that's really important because if you're attacking a sentry, that means it's on a server, which means basically Nanotech is, for all, again, intents and purposes, is a two strength break. It comes in at two strength for whatever you care, because if you're dealing with a sentry, it's on a server. Not entirely true, actually. You can deal with like things like Sapper. Or uh, whatever that other one, Engine Techie, is called. So not entirely true, but most of the time this will be two strength. Because you can deal with this in R&D, and that's kind of wild. Okay, um, just to talk a bit about the flavor on this thing. I'm not that well versed about it, but I've been told... Uh, excuse me, my like, flash is slightly broken, so this website is not showing properly because I opened 100 tabs at once. This is called a Thrilling Adventure Hour. Um, it's a thing. It's, in fact, a stage production in the style of old-time radio, and it's been going on for a while now. I think this happens mostly in a bar in Los Angeles. I think it's now on a... What's it called? A podcast? Something like that. Uh, it seems to have like a big... I'd never heard of this before. It has two main stories. One of them is actually Sparks, Nevada, Marshall on Mars, and it's this cowboy story, uh, or a Western segment on Mars. This is like a radio stage teleplay, and nanotech seems to be a reference from this, which is pretty cool. A nanotech is a form of nanotech that Martians are imbued with. It's actually that's given to something. It's like a rite of passage. Uh, Martians are not born with nanotech, but upon their 11th cycle, Martian younglings undergo a maturation ritual known as the Hero's Quest, which determines if they're worthy of nanotech. 
And this explains a bit of what nanotech is, or more what the ritual is, and it, it deals in with the Martians' religions. They worship the great nanotech. So this is a kind of a cool reference to this, uh, to the thrilling adventure hour, or the, actually the, the Mars Western. Interestingly enough, uh, I went back, this was pointed out in other things, there's actually other cards in this cycle that probably were inspired by this thrilling adventure hour. There's the Inversification Ray, which is a ray that turns things inside out. And we also saw a card earlier in the cycle called Inversificator, which came in red sand, so that's kind of cool if we're missing out. The reference there. But otherwise, uh, I like the art on this a lot too. This is a killer. And it's a good killer. It is a really good killer. So just like we said before, it comes down as a two strength sentry breaker that breaks one per subroutine. And that's very similar to what used to be for a long time the gold standard of killers. And this has come up so many times. This is the core set. For three credits, you get a three strength sentry breaker that breaks one per subroutine. This costs one more and has one less strength as long as there's only one ice. As soon as somebody puts two ice on a server, which they will a lot of times because you are a shaper, this becomes a mimic that you can boost the strength of. Which is nuts? That's crazy. This is really good. Uh, it's also one influence, which is the same as mimic. Which is crazy too. I think just about every deck that splashed mimic in it, a lot of shaper decks actually brought mimic into faction for the one influence because shapers didn't have a good sentry breaker before, now have a much stronger option, an option that I think in a lot of circumstances is actually better than Mimic, depending on how much ice is in the meta. And if we just want to compare but how big of a deal this is, let's look at the other sentry breakers that have existed in a shaper. I'm not looking at the stealth ones, just like the normal ones. This is a bit more expensive at 5, it comes on a 2, but it breaks 2 per sentry subroutine. That's terrible. And this is Pipeline which comes in at 1, and it's 2 for plus 1 strength, which is not great either. And now we have something that is in very, very, very comparable to Mimic, which is crazy good. Um, this thing breaks sentries really cheap, and the later the game goes, the bigger it gets. If there's 3 ice on a server, uh, yeah, if there's 3 ice on a server, you're going through an Ichi for 3 credits. That's the best you can ask for, besides going through it for free with stealth. That's really good. Um, and you're actually going to put the runner or the corp in weird situations where they think like, oh, I got a sentry on HQ, but if I put another piece of ice in front of it, it's going to save the runner three credits, so I'm not going to do that. And I like that there's that sort of like interaction where now the corp might be planning their servers based on whether or not they expect or whether or not there is a nanotech. I think that's kind of cool. Um, I like that sort of interaction, but this card is really good. Um, now, it's admittedly like... The, the, a lot of times people compare this to Architect, what's the cost of breaking an Architect? Because that's the sort of ice that you need to break turn one if you're contesting against like HB ice. And it's not great, it breaks us for four credits, because you have to, oh no, five credits, oops. So you have to pay three to boost and then two for sentry subroutines, but as soon as they put another ice on front of the Architect server, you're going through this for two credits. Which you can't really ask for better. This is crazy. It's so good. It's just the math is good on it. It breaks a lot of things for cheap. Later in the game, it gets better. It disincentivizes corps from icing up their servers too much because then this gets good. So maybe they only put their sentries on like one ice deep servers to protect their assets or archives or what have you. It's cool. One influence, you can play this everywhere. You can import this into criminal, even though they have good killers. You can even play this in, instead of mimic in anarch. And you, it wouldn't be crazy. It honestly probably wouldn't be crazy. But this is the one thing that confuses me. There's a thing in Neverton called the color pie, and the idea is that you can take all the factions, and all the factions have their own unique strengths. And uh, with the three types of uh, ice, each um, faction was meant to be specifically good at dealing with one of them. So Anarchs are good at tearing down walls. They had access to cards like Corroder from the core set, and now they have Paperclip. Those are the best fractors in the game. Criminals are meant to be the best at killers, and they have Mongoose, and from the course that they have Femme Fatale, which is a very powerful program, and then Shapers are the good at ones at Code Gates, and they have Cyber Cypher and Gordian Blade from the core set, which is really, really good. But then things like this happen, where you get cards that are just like, I think, perhaps rivaling Mongoose that are out of faction. We've seen this before too, where like Lady was printed for a while when before it was on the most wanted list and this was like the best fractor for a long time even though it wasn't Anarch. Uh, it's kind of weird and I don't like that. I like I kind of feel like Nanotech a lot of times might actually be better than Mongoose. And that's a bummer. Uh, because it just kind of breaks the color pie. I don't know how ubiquitous this card's gonna be, but it's good.
And it's easy to splash. Mimic also just broke the color pie. So does Yogg, though. Anarchs. Ooh, we got some criminal cards here. This is Leave No Trace. It's two credits, it's a run event, and it says make a run. When the run ends, derez all ice that was rezzed during this run, and it's three influence. I realize there's something I really want to really quick. We're going to backpedal one sec here. I think Noun Tech is also really cool just because it is one influence. So all the mini factions, Apex, who kind of needs a Sentry Breaker, but also Sunny and Adam have access to a very solid Sentry Breaker for not a lot of influence. That's a big deal. So just wanted to say that. Anyways, sorry, back to this. Make it run. When the run ends, derez all ice that was rezzed during this run. You make a run, you leave no trace. Everything just goes back the way it was. And I am terrified of this card. Jesus. Uh, let's close some of the shop down. This card's very similar to Blackmail. And Blackmail, my, mind you, is now a card that costs you th three influence because it was absurd. Uh, and Blackmail says, pick a server, run on it. And the corp can't raise the dice. And if you makes it hard to score agendas a lot of the time if you're scoring agendas in a remote and leave no trace kind of puts the corp in a very uncomfortable position it says either res your ice and pay money for it and then it'll do nothing unless it has like a very powerful effect when i hit it whether or not you can break it that's a different question or don't and you'll get in so you're basically saying oh you have something in that server oh you're gonna res your ice twice because maybe you'll run again uh I think I'm simplifying it. Let's talk about the situations for this. <laughs> Let's break it up into two situations because everything here is two situations. So let's play in the situation that you're running on a server and you have no programs installed. So you just want to run, you just want to make the corpse spend money resing ice and then it gets derezzed and uh, let's talk about what can happen there. Now if you play um, a leave no trace, you run a remote, inside the remote is an asset or something, it's not an agenda, the corp might actually think, no, I'm not resing my ice, that's way too expensive, and you get in. So for the big cost of two credits, you kind of have an inside job that went through a whole server. Which is crazy, inside job does work on res dice, mind you, but you have an inside job that just like, basically a blackmail that went through a whole server, and that alone is pretty good. It changes how you play the game if you want to kind of like hinge on your leave no trace because you're going to try probably not and res ice on remote servers. I think this card is specifically good on remote servers because leave no trace on HQ or R&D is not fantastic. On HQ it is a bit better, but it's not the best. But on remote is good and paying two credits for an inside job, that's, that's good. Also, this card is like absurdly gross. Like the grossest thing with en passant. Because you make a run and the corp thinks like, no, I'm not resing that. Access HQ, I don't give a shit. You can now en passant it because you made a successful run and they didn't res their ice. And I'm expecting some brutal openings here. Just like the most brutal opening where turn, click one, turn one, leave no trace HQ. The corp thinks, I'm not going to spend my credits resing ice. Fine, access. Click two en passant. Trash the ice on HQ. Click three account siphon. And good luck with that! You have no money, you have no ice, and it puts you in a, such a bad situation. Because what happens otherwise? If you res your ice, would leave no trace. Oh, it's a... Oh, I don't know. Bastion. Not a very honest example of ice get, that gets played in the competitive scene right now, but it's, oh, you spend four credits and nothing happened. You just spend four credits to stop a single axis, and now they can just run HQ. And they know they can run HQ because you showed them the ice. That is disgusting. So... I think actually Bastion's a really bad example because I think a lot of times you won't res the ice unless it has a really good face check. So you need ice that actually hits the runner. If the runner hits it with no programs, it's going to be bad. And I wanted to say DNA Tracker is a good example of this, but I don't actually know if resing this is almost ever the right play. Because if someone, what's this card called, excuse me, leave no traces into a DNA Tracker, your options are spend 8 credits to do 3 net damage and make the runner lose 6 credits, which is not, like, that sounds okay and it, it, it's highly dependent on how much credits you have the sort of game the board stain all like that but i think a lot of times you just can't afford to spend eight credits on that and that's the biggest thing about this card it's actually a thing that i've been saying for a while now that i'm not really excited about the derez abilities on cards that have been printed so often in criminal is that it changes the value of ice so in such a big way um 
a lot of times people evaluate the strength of ice on the fact that you pay for it once and it's on the table forever and it's a continuous tax. Like DNA tracker is very expensive, but once you res it, even if the runner fires through it once and it hits the six credits and three net damage, it's going to be there forever. And this is the same sort of problem that you've had with ice destruction back in the day where you could cipher parasite everything. People were very frustrated with that because it takes the value of ice and just screws it up so hard. The ability that like, oh, if I spend eight credits resing a piece of ice, it's no longer going to be a permanent thing. And leave no trace kind of puts you in that same spot. It's like, do I res this for eight credits just so I can res it for eight credits again? And that makes that ice pretty bad and leave no trace pretty good. You also get so much value with this card if you play low. It's just like all the D-Res effects that we talked about. And this technically is a D-Res effect. It says D-Res on it, right? Because if they res the ice with leave no trace, you gain two credits. It was a free thing to do. And once they de-res it, if you play Kiros McIntyre, you actually gained money. So you can play this thing honestly. I don't encourage it, but you could technically play it as an econ card. And that's wild. It gets even better. And of course it gets better, because now if they de-res the ice with low, so you can res it again. You have a chance of resing again. You also have compromised employee if you want to play all those. And like you can make a fair bit of money going through this sort of stuff. And it's really good, even if you have your breakers. And that's... A really big thing. What about if you have your breakers? I think that's where this card gets really powerful. Say you have all your breakers on the table and there's two, three ice on a remote, and there's an agenda in there, you think, and you're playing Los and you have your compromised employees and you have your Kiros and everything, and you leave no trace that remote. The corpse put in a bad situation. If what do they do? They can res all their ice. It'll cost them like maybe, I don't know, ten credits if we're being kind of liberal on the cheap side and then you gained a bunch of money with all your lows and compromised employees and kiros and at the end of the day the corp has nothing to show for it besides they taxed you a little bit because you gained a lot of that money back and that's gross that's gross it changes the value of ice it just makes it oh i'm gonna kind of vamp the corp Cool thing about this card, it also gives you information on what the ice is, and that's something that criminals can get value out of. Maybe you're playing Inversificator and now you know what ice it is on a remote server, so now you can put it on archives because you don't want it there. You know what it is. That's cool. You can also play Forge Activation Orders once they have not enough credits to res the piece of ice to trash it, and that's cool. It's also a run event, so you can play with Ken, get some more value of it, play it for free with public terminals, get some more value from it. But it's, it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And we've seen this again with the D-Res effects. I'm keeping repeating myself here, but... Tollbooth. How many times can you res this in a game? Because if I'm running your... If I'm playing this as a run event to run your scoring remote, and you have to res a Tollbooth just to end the run and gain three credits, and then the Tollbooth gets d and then I can run it again, and you have to spend eight more credits, and then after that, I can maybe Rubicon it? You don't res your Tollbooth anymore, and your ice becomes useless. I'm really scared about this. I think Rubicon is actually probably the worst defender, but it puts the corpse in a really bad situation where once the runner has an economic advantage over them, they can just erase everything. And this makes the corpse say either pack really ex horrible ice that if I hit it like an architect, it's it's honestly bad for me. But even in that case, you can prepare for it and you can go. And I'm so scared for the cheese of turn one, uh, leave no trace into account siphon on passant. Like that's horrible. It's a really strong card. I like the art a lot. It's a tsunami. Uh, it looks like a tsunami, right? Like it's a city, it's a wave. Oh man. Oh man. This is Rip Deal. I also think it has like a tsunami type waves on it. It's three credits. It's a run event. Uh, it's also one influence. This card, mind you, is three influence, so you probably won't splash it. This one you can splash. It's a run event and it says make a run on HQ. If successful, when you would access any number of cards from HQ, you may instead add that many cards from your heap to your grip. It's a replacement effect. After that, remove Rip Deal from the game instead of trashing it. This is a criminal recursion card, which is something, if you talked to me months ago, I would say would never exist. And then Steve Cambridge came out, and so now we've destroyed that tenant. But this is crazy. It is a technically like very, very neutral way to recur anything uh, in criminal. It's also one of the influence, so you can play this anywhere. It's it's interesting. Talking firstly about the design, I'm very excited that, I don't know if I want to say FFG has learned, but at least this sentence here, remove rip deal from the game instead of trashing it, that is the biggest deal. We've seen problems for a long time in Netrunner with recursion, that recursion gets so good that you can take any broken card in the game, if you want to call it broken, and you can just play it as many times as you want if you can keep recurring it. 
I think Friends in High Places is a card, it's a card that recurs things, and this one specifically is like the worst defender on a card that needs to have the text removed from game after you play it. Because the problem with Friends in High Places, you play Friends in High Places, you put this back in your deck, you keep playing the same Friends in High Places, and shit just keeps coming back. And no one can keep up with it. The tempo from this card is absolutely nuts. If this said remove from game, it would be a bit better. I still think it would be a problem, but the fact that this card actually removes itself from the game is a pretty big deal. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Um, otherwise, it's a recursion card. Pay three. Pay more money, because mind you, you have to run HQ, and there's probably going to be ice on there that you have to break. So you paid a lot of money, and you get a recur. At first, you only get a recur one card, right? If you don't play around this card or build your deck around this card, this card only recurs you one card. And say, on average, maybe you're spending six or seven credits for this. You're not getting access on HQ. What is worth recurring at that? Like, how, are you going to recur one card that costs you like six, seven cards, and this card, like, is that good? Uh, it can be okay. I think it might be alright to recur something like a Temujin contract in particular. This card, it represents about 16 credits, so sometimes paying like six or seven to get one of these back actually might be the right play. It's also good if you have Temujin on HQ, which makes the rip deal a bit easier to use. But I think actually, like, perhaps most interesting about this card is that this lets you recur programs and that was a way to win against criminals if criminals did not have a way to uh recur some of their like very important programs and you trash them for some reason rip deal technically even if you don't have like a really good use for this in your deck if you include this in your deck just as like a, a panic button that you can get your gordian blade back from the heap uh that honestly might be worth it I don't think it's great, but the idea is that maybe you put this as a one of slot in your deck and usually you recur a Temujin contract or a current or something like this, but you have the option to recur something if something goes terrible. That's kind of interesting. That being said, if this is your only decoder and there's code gates on HQ, yeah, good luck with that. Now this card gets really good when you start accessing more than one card, and that's the coolest thing about this card. It says if successful, when you would access any number of cards from HQ, instead recur that many cards. So if you have an HQ interface down, you're running HQ getting two cards back, and that's obviously really good. This card isn't unique, you can get four cards down. I think this card's a good reason to run the gauntlet, and uh, it's a hardware that's actually really good, but it's been overshadowed by how good other consoles are in Criminal, mostly Desperado. But the idea with the gauntlet is you can make just about any run. Uh, uh, as long as there's ice on HQ, it, you get three cards back with a rip deal. So you're paying one credit per card, plus whatever it costs you to get into HQ, but all in all, that's not bad. That obviously gets really good. You also have access to Nerve Agent if you want to maybe do this in Anarch. This is only one influence, but Anarch is generally good at recurring things anyways. But this could be okay. You could also play this with Steve Cambridge, mind you, if you want to go all in on the recursion, but... I spelled his name wrong. But, uh, if you're running HQ anyways, maybe you get a bit more for it. I see this card actually seeing some sort of play in a prepaid voice pad economy deck. Because, think about this. You can play this for cheap if you have your prepaid voice pads down. If you're playing this in criminal, you also get a bit... Um, you, this goes a bit further if you want to play public terminal, because this is a run event. And now you can run HQ, maybe with your gauntlet, with maybe with your HQ interface, and see or recur three cards. And if you're playing prepaid voice pad, one of the best things you can do is have more operations, or sorry, more events to play. So what's better than having one lucky find in your deck is playing that same lucky find maybe two or three times. And I think, actually, there might be a pretty good uh, prepaid voice pad economy that involves like rip deal and then recurring your good operations i think that's pretty sweet and that might actually be worth tinkering into whether you want to play that in shaper and pay one influence for this i don't know maybe not you're probably better off in criminal because you can uh maybe play your prepaid voice pads for free with a supplier and get your hq interfaces out for cheaper with a supplier that might be cool but it's definitely okay very interesting card. Criminal Recursion is cool. It's, um, you also have to access cards too, so this is not going to work in like an Eater Account Siphon deck, so you're not going to be able to recur your Account Siphons, but this card also will let you recur your Account Siphons as long as you have like a legitimate way to access. Uh, and I think that's really scary, the ability that you can run HQ with a gauntlet and then get all your account siphons back, or like a two account siphons and a Temujin contract. Or even if you've already ran HQ, right, you just pulled back, uh, three copies of, um, uh, what's it called? Emergency shutdown, and then you derez everything that you could look at, and that's fucking scary. Even recurring things like uh, what's his name? Oh man, everything's falling apart now. Uh, the guy, political operative, the guy. That's good too. Yeah, political operative. That's good too.
Worth noting, the first card we talked about was a CD thing, and there's actually a card here that combos with CD cards. What is it called? Populist Rally or something? Is that correct? Yeah, this card only can fire if you have a CD card installed, and Blue Moose is actually everywhere where this card becomes a lot more playable. It's not the best effect, but just watch out. Last card, I think. I think. This is a flashbang. It is a... It's a killer, technically. But it's an icebreaker. Uh, it is criminal. It comes in for 5, which is expensive. It takes up 1 MU. And it comes in at no strength. You can boost strength 1 for 1. And this is the first icebreaker in the game that doesn't break ice subroutines. It says 6 credits. d is Sentry currently being encountered. And it is 3 influence. This is a card you got on your table, and it derezzes sentries. That's all it does. It just derezzes sentries. It's very important to understand the rules of Netrunner. If you want to interact with a piece of ice, you're going to have to actually boost up to its strength. So if you're dealing with a three-strength sentry, or if you're dealing with... What do we always use? We use Ichi as the test. If you're trying to derez an Ichi, you have to pay four credits to get up to four strength, and then you're going to have to spend six more. So you're going to spend ten credits derezzing this Ichi. Remember, you have to boost strength. Okay, uh, D-Res effects, huh? We've talked about this before. Uh, we've seen programs that specifically, or not specifically, but also D-Res cards. And I just want to compare these two together. This is Golden. It's an Icebreaker Killer. And just let's like look at the cost to D-Res and Ice with this as compared to the cost of D-Resing with this. Because at a first glance, Flashbang looks prohibitively expensive. Same install cost on both of these. But if you want to D-Res something like an Ichi, let's go back to the good old Ichi example. Uh... Oh, we can't open both of these, right? So you need a boost to strength. So that's four credits on golden. You need to break all the subroutines. So that's another four credits. And then you need to pay two more credits to return golden to your grip and derez the sentry. Now on top of that, you have to spend another click and five more credits reinstalling the golden. And this was the problem with these the cast of Falcons is that they never really caught on because their derez effects are incredibly expensive as compared to Flashbang, which is actually the cheapest option that you have to, to repeatedly derez things over and over again. Uh, well, besides Rubicon Switch, but Rubicon Switch has conditions attached to it that the thing has to be res during the turn, you can only use it once per turn. I don't think this cost is too bad. Because as long as you have money, you're putting the corp in a really bad situation where it's if they res the sentry, you'll likely de-res it. And yeah, you'll both lose money, but I think you'll come out on top. And a good reason why you'll come out on top is, again, because you're playing Los. And every time you res a piece of ice, you've gone two credits. So you can just say that this thing says four credits to de-res the sentry. If you're playing Kiros McIntyre, which you are, it's two more credits. So this is now two credits to de-res the sentry subroutine. If you're playing Compromise Employee, that's maybe three more credits. Like, this is not going to be expensive. Compromise Employee. You play Data Psyker, it's so much cheaper. But you can come to a point where you have an economic advantage over the corporation. And you can de-res every single sentry they res. Trivially. And they just won't res sentries anymore. And that's kind of the dream with the D-Res decks. You get the runner to, or the corp to a point where resing doesn't make any sense because they're losing money and you're not losing that much money. And when the corp has no money, they can't do anything. Uh, sure, you can't do anything without money, but if the corp has no money, they're clicking for credits and then agendas pull into HQ and then you win. Oh, also, by the way, Crescentus is the only other way to D-Res things cheaply, but this is not permanent. Yeah, I don't know much what to say here. This seems really scary. Mm, this card is a bit expensive to use. Like, I don't think this can be your de facto killer, uh, like, turn one. Just because if you do hit an Architect, not only is this 5 to install, which is expensive, but, like, to de an Architect, it's going to cost you 9 credits, which is a fair bit. So I think this is kind of card that you want to install later in the game once you have, like, a substantial economy, once everything's kind of set up. It's also a really good surprise when, like, the Corp is down to 3 credits, perhaps, because they think, oh, all my ice is res, I'm okay, and then you de all the ice on HQ or on R&D, because it's all sentries for some reason. It's cool that this card actually pairs well with Rosetta. The idea is that early game you can put down your Sentry Breaker and then late game once you're ready to be like, oh, I don't need to break Sentries anymore, we're just de-resing them. Uh, you can pull out with your Rosetta and find your Flashbang and you, you don't pay 5 for it anymore. You pay like 2 or whatever and you install it without a click or without finding it from your deck and that's really cool. I like the idea that you can kind of like upgrade your deck slowly and that's interesting as long as you don't draw it. Also, for what it's worth, if this came out early in the cycle, I would assume that we would get the whole kit, like a whole line of breakers, uh, where like the criminal also gets a way to deal with code gates and barriers, but I don't think we will, uh, considering it's so close to the end of the cycle, so this is probably the only one 
which is interesting because like we said earlier when we talked about the color pie criminals are meant to be good at dealing with sentries also for what it's worth you could combo this together with paintbrush and make everything a sentry very slowly though and after it's rezzed and dealt with but you can technically derez everything again i don't this is like the fifth or sixth way that we've seen in this last cycle of how to derez stuff I still think Rubicon's the best, and I still think Rubicon's incredibly oppressive. This card also, like, maybe isn't as good as just playing Rub Rubicon and Brute Force hack, which is a lot more flexible, but I think once this card gets down, Corpse might not just res sentries anymore, and then you're kind of in the win- like, that's really good for you, because you don't have to use this card. But with the proper setup, this card actually isn't that expensive. It's probably cheaper than dealing with a lot of ice. It really is probably cheaper than dealing with a lot of stuff. That's wild. Good luck resing an archer. You're going to derez it. Oh, it'll cost you like 12 credits. It'll be totally worth it, though. That's all the runner cards. Uh, some really good stuff in this pack. I think Blue Moose is incredibly good. It's going to be around for a long time. For a long time. I mean, this is going to be a staple. I think this is one of the most, like, neutral. This is, is super good and everything cards we've seen in a long time. This card's are great. This card is definitely valuable. Uh, I don't think about that. This is interesting. This is a really good card. I think we'll see this for a long time coming. This is scary. This is interesting. I think it only see play in like really um, focused decks, decks that want to maybe prepaid and play HQ pressure. HQ pressure, mind you, is really scary. If you're doing that, you also probably want to play Gang Sign because that combos together. So that's a fun deck on its own. Uh, and Flashbang is a bit niche. I don't think you can actually play this that much outside of Los because Los gets so much value out of this because Los gets like four credits, kind of, because they res it once and if they don't res it again, it's more money. Uh, like, it's really hard to play as anyone else. It is incredibly expensive. But, uh, it's a quite the pack, and we still have 11 cards on the corpse side. Let me know what you think about this pack. I'm going to be trying to play some cards, some decks with these new cards in it. I think we're going to start with Noise. Uh, noise and Blue Moose seems fun. But let me know what I've missed, what kind of cool interactions you're excited about. And I always read those. I appreciate those a lot. Otherwise, stay tuned. We're going to have the corpse side of this up, hopefully soon enough. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned. Ciao.